Transitioning from data analytics to project management and then further on to program management made me realize just how much data analysts could benefit from understanding basic project management concepts. And mainly because when I was a data analyst, I didn't. Hindsight and all that. After all, data analysts build personal project portfolios to apply for jobs where they work on projects. And so while I might not be going back to data analytics, at least I can share some of the things that I've learned about where the fields overlap from my experience in project management. So here goes. Number one, don't ever manage your project. It's kind of counterintuitive to the title of this video, but a mistake that can be done by both project managers as well as data analysts is to overmanage the project, which means that instead of being proportional to how much work the project is going to take as well as how much time it's going to take, you should be measuring your project management efforts against that. So if you're working on a couple days long project that is likely going to take you five hours in total, maybe you don't have to, you know, spend several hours creating project documentation to outline all the tasks and, and all the different deliverables for that maybe a one pager explaining what you're doing is sufficient, which will probably take you like 20 minutes to write. So making sure that you're not blowing up your workload with project management tasks that then are going to take you more time than the actual work is one of the things that I really want to call out first. The second thing that I want to talk about is what is the return on investment on your projects? Before you even start, make sure and this is kind of where I, I hinted at the one pager, for example, in the previous point, outline why you're creating this project. And whether it's an analysis, whether it's a dashboard, anywhere where you spend your time, you should be thinking about why is this important? Who is this going to benefit and how and how much? And are there opportunities that will actually have a bigger impact? And don't go down the rabbit hole of doing things just for, you know, curiosity or acquiring knowledge. As data analysts, we do tend to like really learning about new stuff and creating new knowledge. But in a lot of businesses, knowledge for knowledge's sake is actually not that valuable. So. Um, making sure that you understand what exactly your work is doing for the organization and what the benefit is, is a great way to, first of all, justify your work, but also think about things like performance reviews and, and how your work measures against your colleagues after a while if you're looking at career growth. So that's my second tip. And by the way, I know that a lot of people haven't subscribed to this channel and they're still watching the videos. So if you do like this kind of content on data, project management, careers in tech, why don't you hit the subscribe button? Totally free. Anyway, third thing, spend time on gathering requirements. And this is often where we kind of don't get clear enough on what we're actually trying to deliver. Usually we're trying to solve some kind of a problem but in order to be efficient in solving that problem, you need to have your requirements clear. What exactly is it that you're delivering? How is it going to solve that problem or fulfill the need for whoever you're creating the project for? And are those requirements enough to sufficiently and in a satisfactory way solve that problem? And be very clear about doing that if you're creating this project for somebody else of involving them and I'll, I'll talk a bit about stakeholders later, but um, spend some time doing that and have like a clear list of requirements um, of what needs to be delivered in order for the project to be complete because this also helps you down the line to say that the project is actually finished. Speaking of when the project is actually finished, the fourth point that I want to make is start with scope. And this is kind of related to the requirements but once you have an understanding of the problem, you also need to understand what problems you're not solving within the project. So scope is one of the three key main constraints in project management. The other two are budget and time. And I personally think scope is probably the most important because it's where we most of the time go wrong. And so that is kind of the thing that normally goes south when people start adding new deliverables to a project in the middle of the project without considering the impact 
to budget or timeline. And the problem with scope is that a lot of the times we increase it to people please or under pressure or without even realizing we're doing this. So I think whether you're working on your personal projects or on work projects, actually showing that you're able to clearly define the requirements and explicitly define what is in the scope of the projects and what is not in the scope of the project. So what is not in the scope of the projects are the activities and deliverables that you will not be doing within that project shows actually a lot more maturity than just being able to complete a project within a timeline. They're related, but I think showcasing that you can do that and you're aware that that's an important part of managing a project is actually a really great thing. So even when you're building a project portfolio for yourself, maybe think about how you can incorporate that and showcase that you've actually thought about where the borders of your project are. Start with that because it's really easy afterwards to get confused about what your project is actually about if you haven't really clearly defined this for yourself. Start with scope before you even start considering doing anything else for the project. Tip number five is create a product breakdown structure. And I think I've probably mentioned work breakdown structures before. Work breakdown structures are essentially a list of tasks that gives you an overview of what is being done in the project. A work breakdown structure, on the other hand, is a list of deliverables. So in order for you to be absolutely clear with your stakeholders for the project on what is being delivered, a work breakdown structure is a really great way to visualize that, make it clear what the outcome is going to be and look like, and get on the same page with everybody on the project that this is what you're actually going to be delivering. So it's essentially just a list of things that you will deliver within the project. This might be if you are say creating a dashboard as an analyst, you might want to actually clearly list out what sections you have in the dashboard and exactly what widgets and data points you'll be incorporating into the dashboard so that if there's anything missing that could solve the problem or benefit the user. The stakeholders can call that out before you start building anything. So that is one way to do it. Same with any sort of analysis documents, making sure that you list out the sections that you're going to be covering, what questions you're trying to answer and how you're trying to answer them really helps in setting expectations and making sure that your expectations and your stakeholders expectations are the same. Speaking of stakeholders, number six is going to be involve stakeholders early and as early as possible, preferably. So when you're ideating the project, bounce around ideas with the people that would maybe be using whatever you're trying to produce or who your project would be benefiting. So try and have a conversation with them on if that is actually matching their expectations on what would solve the problem. And then when you start creating your project plan, ask for feedback regularly in order to stay aligned with the stakeholders and understand what exactly is it that they need and do that throughout the project, but start as early as possible because that way not only are you going to be aligned with them, but it's easier to get their buy-in than if you build something and then you're gonna be like, hey, by the way, built this for you guys, now use it. And maybe it's sort of half usable for them and kinda addresses the problem, but you might need to actually spend a lot more time working on it afterwards because half of it actually doesn't work for them. So then they're less satisfied with it. And even after it's done, it might not be as enthusiastically received as if you actually had built it together. So really wanted to point that out because a lot of the times that gets forgotten gotten within projects. Tip number seven is when you have your requirements and you have your work breakdown or a product breakdown structure, do you go ahead and create yourself a timeline with milestones? Not only is this going to be clear for you to see where you are with your project, it makes it easier for you to have one place where people can go and see where you are in the project, what's the latest status, if you have any roadblocks that you can then communicate to your stakeholders that hopefully will actually be able to help you solve roadblocks if you have them, but if you don't have any way to communicate those to them, it's really hard for anybody to help you. So I'd say a timeline with clear milestones and whether you're on track or late or if your project is at risk really helps just having a one place 
one source of truth on the status of your project and how it's going. So that's just one communication point. Related number eight is communicate your progress. One of the things that is really easy to just forget because you get so, you know, head down at work, focused on your analysis is to make sure that the people that are interested in your work actually know what your progress is, where you are, what the status is, if there's anything that you need from them or they can help you with, because it's more annoying to have to get a lot of queries from people all the time asking for the status updates than actually having a clear idea of like, this is how and when I communicate progress. This is where you can find the latest status updates and the timeline within other times. Like this is going to be up to date, no need to ask me for status updates constantly and that way everyone's kind of happy and on the same page all the time. Maybe you want to have a regular meeting with the people that are most relevant to your project um, to make sure that if you have any questions, if they have any questions, they get answered or just do like email, a message, whatever the way that your organization communicates that clearly states the status. And I think making sure that even when you're learning data analytics and trying to become a data analyst, you think about this and how you would communicate your progress. And I always think that making sure that you know how to showcase soft skills within data analytics is super important for your portfolio. So even if you maybe created like a sample status update for like a certain part of your project, say you've completed certain things in your project, you might have a roadblock, which is like you don't say you haven't learned a certain thing and you're expecting to clear that roadblock by a certain date because you're planning on studying on it and then outline your next steps and have like this sort of status update say on one PowerPoint slide, put that within your project, showcase that you'd be able to clearly communicate where you were in that specific time in that project and sort of add those little things in that just showcase that you understand what the entire process even within an organization would look like and you're a good person to work with because you're able to communicate and not just you know, tunnel vision work uh, about yourself. And yeah, so that's my final tip. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, hit the thumbs up button. And if you'd like more content like this in the future, hit the subscribe button. And I will see you in the next one. Cheers.